Oscar. Okay. All right. So uh, let me move this closer to me here. Oh, I guess I can just do it this way. That's fine. I can sit down. No, 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 no. Because you don't know when I'm going to cue the next one up. And I want to keep saying cue it, cue it, cue it. Oh, okay. 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 So I'll go from there. Okay. But I'll take your offer up on another time. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Two experiences were given at General Church. I know that, Doreen, you were on Metuchen and you went through it there. So maybe you can give us a little flavor from what their interpretations was. The apostles did a really good job of. of Taking taking the issues out to kind of relate to us. I don't know. Have you guys heard them? I heard the I heard well, I've heard both, mm -hmm. but I I got Irvine. details of one from Irvine. Oh, okay. All right. You haven't heard anything. You haven't heard anything. So, right. um, very appropriate experiences that were had here. We'll see the two of them. Uh, hit the hit the right arrow. Oh, the right arrow. Yeah. Got it. Okay. I'm going to need some help. Because there's a lot of reading that goes to this thing. So um, if someone would like to start to volunteer with this thing. Joni does. Joni does? <laughs> there I am. <laughs> this evening I was praying and the spirit of God overcame me. The gift of tongues came forth, followed by the world, the word of the Lord stating, See my servant now and hear his word. Thus saith the Lord. At that moment, I believed in front of me as a, an angelic being dressed in white and adorned in the glory of God. He appeared to have golden white hair. I recognized him as the angel Gabriel, whom I have seen before. He began to speak to me and said, I have been sent from the Father to show you now <clears throat> the turbulent times that are before you. Son of the latter day work, look what do you see? Okay. Oh, I don't like that yet. <laughs> it's is scary it, is already. it timely? Yeah. yeah. Are there turbulent times? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so, and there's some validation here. You know, he sees the angel Gabriel that has been given warnings in the past in the scripture. So he's he's got some validation and credibility when he shows up to say, I've been sent by by the father to talk to you about what you're gonna see in the world today uh -huh. so what's what's really neat if that's the right word is that gabriel is the same gabriel that came to mary and said yeah. you're going to have a baby okay. that's the same gabriel that you know that that's the gabriel yeah <laughs> you know that the guy that's, yeah it's like what? wow yeah. Yeah. well the guy has credibility <laughs> yeah He's not like Clarence in It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> this guy has his wings already, you know, so another reading if you can. I then saw a vision of the Capitol building of the United States of America. It began to crumble at its foundation. The angel spoke and said, look now and see a house that is divided cannot stand. This now, this now will happen. What will happen? Your government will fall in confusion and the nation, the nation will suffer from it. See now, son of the latter day, what do you see? I then saw greater chaos in the streets of large cities. I saw anger, anger and frustration. I saw people being assaulted. The angel then spoke again, stating, son of the latter day, see now how the protection of God is taken because of disobedience. See now how sin and evil can mm -hmm. rage in the hearts of men and women. You see good news in this, John? Now this is this is being stated by somebody at at, at church. Somebody within recently. the church. Yeah, yes, uh, like like a month yeah. ago. Like uh, the conference was given. This was given and approved at conference in October, mm -hmm. right? But this experience was given the beginning of 2021. Okay, by a member of the church, right? Who was saying this came to him in a vision, a dream, vision, a vision, a vision. A vision. yeah, and an experience with this. So, so they in April, the apostles, and, and again, I'll kind of jump ahead a little bit. The apostles have a, a criteria that they follow when these things happen to people. You, you bring the experience, the dream, the vision that you had to the church, and the apostles meet. And, and sometimes, unfortunately, it takes the apostles some time to meet and discuss these things. That's why there's the lag. <coughs> but <coughs> there's a criteria, and we're going to go through the criteria that they review to see if this is just 
a spaghetti dream? Uh, or is this something just for you or me? Or is this something that could apply to everybody, you know, that needs to be out there for a all points bulletin, if you will. And so the apostles, and we'll get to this, they decided that, you know, this has validity because we saw the Capitol building. I mean, the foundation almost literally got shooken, you know, and, and then, you know, there's, there's movements again that that's not the last we've seen of that kind of a, a disrust and all that stuff. And we see that there's chaos in the streets of the cities. We know that people are angry wherever you go. You know, some of us are frustrated with the whole thing and, you know, people are being assaulted. You know, you can't go to the supermarket anymore without the fear that, you know, that might be your last day when you do something like that. So this is kind of relating to the fact that, you know, I see, I see your, your trouble, but what's the last sentence say? God is taken. Which the protection of, of God. See, the protection of God is taken because of disobedience. So he's saying here that if you're disobedient, you got something to worry about. And we're going to get into this a little bit more. But as, as a nation, this is I think this is why the Spirit was like urging me to understand better Old Testament <coughs> scripture. Because when you see Israel and what happened to them, and the Book of Mormon is clear that Israel and the United States are parallel because we're both founded on the same principle, right? Mm -hmm. The godly principles. <coughs> same thing is happening to us mm -hmm. because the nation as a whole is disobedient. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a saying that says history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. And it repeats itself because of that last sentence. Mm -hmm. It repeats itself because people wander from the principles of the gospel. And what Jesus Christ came to represent to us, and something like that. So it's there. So, son of the latter day, what do you see? <clears throat> I then saw the United States Army and its tanks were driving into the city. They appeared to be trying to keep order. The angel spoke, saying, Son of the latter day, know now. Know now that the civil unrest will be heightened and it will happen within these next few years of mine, of time. Look now on what do you see? I saw the World Operation Center of the Church of Jesus Christ in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, and the saints of God gathering there. They were running to the building to get inside as if to seek shelter. I then saw a white wall erected around the conference center. It was impenetrable barrier. The angel again spoke saying, son of the latter day, see now how much the Lord protects his own. How then, how when you find yourself in the heaven of God's house, the father, the creator will protect and will preserve. How am I gonna get to Pennsylvania? Any comments on that? I think that's um, symbolic. symbolic. Yeah, you'll, you'll, we'll see later as the apostles talked about this. I can't even It's walk. not the fact that we're all going to pack our vans or our RVs and head to Pennsylvania. Yeah. And there was a point in time that said Imperial was the place you're supposed to go. And it's Pennsylvania. You know? And then it was here and then it was there. And you know, some group of people in Independence, Missouri, think it's there yet. You know, it, I think it's a state of, of, of spirit is what he's going to talk about in this situation here that you know going to live amongst all this stuff right but but again and we'll find out some qualifications that allow us some some peace from what this is trying to say because if you just read this thing literally we're all doomed you know <laughs> i mean this this forget it we'll just end it right now in this situation so i'm going to be looking for clarence <laughs> yeah he got yeah, his wings I I mean, well the couple of i guess it was a <coughs> thing brother kevin Topa from michigan yeah. did a noah's ark yeah that's what i was telling and him. it was absolutely amazing and i learned something new that when with your phone there baby i'll start oh that's cliff he's okay. talking um when when noah was you ain't gonna make it hey cliff gotta put it on mute <laughs> oh Sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> when Noah was building the ark, we assumed that he was it was just him and his two sons building this gigantic yeah. sun, right? This big boat. But in reality, probably people in the area were helping him build this boat. And what I didn't realize either that in the ark there were rooms 
Eat up rooms for a All lot of, them. of people. Yeah. Yep. Not, and, you know, because again, when we read the story and learn as a child, we learn, well, it was Noah and his wife and his sons and daughters, and those were the ones that were saved. But God was, God prepared for them rooms. They made a choice. No. Yeah, they made, made a choice. choice. He said no. So when I see these people running to the building to get inside, I'm yeah. like, is that us? Or are those people on the outside that are like, oh, wait. You know, I got to get to safety. You know, it's like, Good point. I think both. it could be both. Yeah. I, th I think, again, I mean, yeah. we're going to get deeper into some of the things that help us get through this thing. And and that, unfortunately, still could be some of us. We need to prepare better is the point that this is getting to. And whether you're on the outside and the light bulb lights up, you know, and you start to come, that's one thing. And if it's us who kind of maybe complacent is a word that fits, you know, we, we're in, but we're not totally in and yeah, this is i think designed to tell us you know what we got to dive into the pool we got to be totally immersed. immersed in this situation here so um you readers are doing a very good job <laughs> see now see now <laughs> how you must flee to this haven how you must find yourself within the confines of this safe place safe by the hand of the lord Son of the latter day, what do you see? I saw the auditorium of the conference center, there gold plates, the records of the Book of Mormon, and the sealed portion of the brother of Jared sitting on the sacrament table. And all eyes were focused on them. The angel then said, Son of the latter day, see now the truth that will come forth and be presented before you, before those who have found themselves anchored, anchored anchored in this haven of rest, his place of safety, this ark of safety that the Father has created. And see now how when his, this comes forth, it will deliver light into the world. And then, and then you will see the dawn break. And then, and then, will you see the miracle, miraculous glory of the Lord Jesus Christ descend upon the people of God? I will just focus on a couple of things. Anchored, yeah. anchored, anchored. If we didn't get it the first time, time, there was a second time. And if you still don't get it, you got a third time. And there's some emphasis about what we need to be anchored in. And he says, I think this is an evolution of a process because he says here, um, and then, and then nothing's happening. And then and nothing's still happening. And then and nothing's then. happening. And then maybe finally you will see the miraculous glory of the Lord Jesus Christ descending upon the people of God. So it's a process that we've got to go through. I don't think we go from here to here, you know, and he's putting out the warning there. You know, check your anchor. Where, where, where are you you're at? You know, are you firmly rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because that's going to be part of what's going to get you through what we see. In the Book of Mormon, I think, as I understand, we have one third, right, approximately, of that word, right? I think it was well we know there's 116 pages we don't have right for sure right and, and that's kind of what the Jaredite record was a huge chunk mm -hmm. that was sealed that was kept from being translated mm -hmm. so that's what this is mm -hmm. and I think it's can't wait <laughs> I'm just like <laughs> I'm going straight to heaven. I go through all that. <laughs> don't want all that. <laughs> Prepare now, son of the latter day, and keep your heart right. Immediately the gift of tongues came forth, followed by the word of the Lord, stating, Thus saith the Father, Hear now the words of my servant Gabriel, who has given this message to me. See now what is before you, and know that your heart must be sure, and your heart must be right, and you must be anchored, anchored, anchored to the principles of my son Jesus Christ, the rock of salvation that was given through him and the sacrifice. Are you there? Is, it your, is your vision clear? Are your eyes focused? Is there love in your heart? Of Is there malice? Oh, that should have been orange. Sorry. Cleanse it now. Cleanse it now that you may see and you may be apart. Thus saith the Lord, the experienced and weak. Well, I didn't type that right, but don't worry about that. That's not what we need to worry about. <laughs> Three words there again. Yep. Anchored, 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 anchored. 
and ask some pertinent questions. Are you there? Something we got to ask ourselves. Nobody else can answer that question for you. you know, is your vision clear? Are your eyes focused? Is there love in your heart? Or is there malice? Talks about cleansing your heart now that you may see and you may be, I don't know what that meant, but thus saith the Lord. So there's, there's it's telling us about preparation. It's telling us to one self-examination. Where are you in relationship to the things that really matter in the world today? In spite of all the stuff that's going on, it's got us concerned and we have to deal with it in that regard. But there's something beyond that that gets us through all that mess. And it's now reflecting on ourselves. Where are you anchored? You know, where is your heart? Where is your focus? And that's the message that's starting to come pretty clear through this whole thing here. Now, they said there's like four questions that the apostles kind of sit around the table and chat with while they eat their candy bars. You know, they got a candy jar. Do? Yeah, they got a candy yeah. jar. She but saw it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, where's our candy? <laughs> so one of the questions is, is it, a, is it a revelation of God? Is God making known something new or is he reaffirming, reaffirming something uh, or reminding the church? Or is he chasing the church? You know, I, I think it's a little bit of all of this. Right. You know, the cost has come to the conclusion that this is a revelation of God. It's a reminder and a reaffirmation of our beliefs. And he says that... Uh, what is currently happening in the world and our nations that the Lord will protect his church. That's one of the things you got to take from this. When you first read what's here, it's pretty, pretty scary. It's pretty disappointing because we see it. This isn't something that's going to happen. This is something that's happening. And it's only going to get ramped up, you know, as time goes by. It was clear that that was documented in, in this experience that was here. But, you know, there's, it's a re reminder that, you know, you're going to be okay if you get what? Anchored, Anchored into the Lord again. This is a revelation that has given pertinent information of the latter-day events. It's resulting that a mighty Gentile nation that turns away from God and gives insights on future events so that we can be prepared as a church of people. So as you watch the news some more and as you see what's happening in your neighborhoods and in your schools and wherever you go, I mean, it's only going to get more depressing. And what this is saying is, okay, I'm telling you it's going to get more depressing, but I tell you this is not where you're at if you're anchored in Jesus Christ. Second question is, what does it mean? This goes on for a couple of slides here because they broke that down into three or four elements. It talks about need for preparation. It says we must be ready as turbulent times unfold and be focused to carry out the work of the Lord. So you got to get busy in this time. Busy within yourself, busy perhaps externally as well, to, to let others understand where they need to be, like those helpers at Noah's Ark. I'm sure that as they were working, Noah was trying to still preach to them that, you know what, I don't know what I'm doing this for, but the God says, is, you know, in a little while, this is all over. And they didn't pay and attention. they laughed at them. Yeah. It's also 100 years worth. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? Like building something for a hundred years. I'm out of here. <laughs> and that's what happened. That's, uh, he started a hundred years before the flood. Talks about the. Uh, he thought he was crazy. Yeah. The parables of the ten virgins. You know the preparation that they did. They were found too late. Five of them. You know it was too late for them to get ready. The light. This is kind of in that realm of reminding us to be prepared. Our hearts continue to be focused on preparations, meaning we are encouraged to labor. To purify our hearts from unrighteousness. How do you do that? Well, I think a lot of it is letting go, like it said, malice. I mean, if you've got something, if you've got a, like a problem with a brother or sister, a problem with a family member, just say you're sorry and move on. I mean, whether they're right, you're right, it really doesn't matter. That's right. But it's it's about love. I mean, it's it's like, you know, if, 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 if I mean, God forbid, if somebody had a problem with me, tell me and I'll, yeah. and I'll say I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll tell, I mean, I'll say I'm sorry. sorry. You know, I'll, I'll say I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. It's not worth it. It's not the, the anger in our heart. It's just there's no there's no room for no, that. No, it's not. It's just a waste of energy. I had a conversation with Tanner yesterday. Uh, you know, he he needs a little refining. In fact, he said that he's sorry he missed church that he wanted to come and testify. testify. Yeah. So I'm not sure what's going on in him to say that or do that. But his mother needed his help. They're taking master's class together. 
and she's stumped on something. So she has to call upon her son to help her out to understand the class. So, you know, they had some confusion about the time, nine o'clock or 9.45. Well, it was 9.30 when she called me to find out his Tanner here. I said, well, he's downstairs yet. Well, he's supposed to be here at nine. And so Tanner's mumbling as he goes out the door. My mother always this and this and this. I said, you know what? Can't you leave me alone? There's this gospel song from the movie Frozen called Let It Go. You know, we ought to put that in the hymnal because I told him, let it go. This stuff is just expense energy that's useless. And your mom, you do. You know, understand the perspective of the other person sometimes. We we, we always have our point of view and we're always right, you know, and we stand our ground. But there, you know, there's something about, you know, the ability to just let it go and listen to see where we're going. And I think the yes, and getting back to this, I think the yes of this is for us to listen to our hearts in terms of our relationship to the Lord. And all the things that we've learned since we were little people, you know, to now, and all the experiences we've had that as we've tried to plow through life on our own and found out how unsuccessful we are with that. And when we've given up and relied upon the Lord in some situation, how easy that solution came in our life and the peace that came in our heart. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the process that they're talking about preparation here because, you know, malice and anger and hate and jealousy and envy and pride are all over the world. And it's so easy for us to fall into that realm. Right. I feel like that guy, you know, I, I, I'm upset with that too. And all of a sudden, boom, we're in that mode. And when we're supposed to kind of be on the other side of the fence, you know, we got to be careful where we're at, because as these events evolve and happen, you know, when, when, when the, the decision comes down that this is it, where we got to be found is on the right side of that. So we need to be filled with God's love. So that's our preparation. And we need to willing to gather as saints and symbolize. It says by the, here we start to get the uh, analogy of the World Operations Center. I mean, that's a facility that we go to. And we're as a unit, we're together, and there's unity there. And it's not practical in our lives today. So this is saying that's just symbolic of what we should be doing all over in our heart, so to speak. I mean, you can write a note to somebody and tell them that you love them or that you're concerned and praying for their condition, something like that. That may be just what they need at that time, and we don't know that. So reaching out together as a people is, is the key that we've got to deal with. That's the white wall of protection is our love of one another that helps us be protected from all this nonsense that's going around us. It doesn't absolve us from maybe having to get involved in it or as, as not involved, but maybe it affecting us. But as it affects us, that's when I think we need to help one another how to get through that situation. <clears throat> what does it mean continue? There's an instruction in this. It says that, the Lord is giving us instruction at the latter day events and uh, that they are fulfillment of the scriptural promises of the faith and doctrine, uh, number 23. I got that here. Um, article 23 says, we believe in the fulfillment and ultimate establishment of the kingdom of God on earth while men are still in the flesh. We refer to this period of time as the peaceful reign which shall precede the millennium or a thousand years with Christ. So this is part of this whole situation, this preparation to be ready for that. And, That's and revealed. Allow, right. This is all. And, and it says, instructing us to examine ourselves as we see the results of disobedience and to correct our focus and prepare our hearts. We have a great benchmark in the world today. It's all this madness. We don't need to be like that. We can't be like that. Somebody's got to be different than that, you know? And I don't believe that as individuals, we're going to change the world, but we can change the heart of somebody. We can impact somebody just by being, being showing the love of God that we have, telling us to stay close to God in the church so that we're ready and able to follow the direction of the Lord as the times unfold in the future. Again, that, that warning, it's, it's bad now, and I'll tell you what, it's going to get worse. And I personally, I think the next election is when we're going to see a lot of this familiar and this, this turbulence going on, this, this division, chaos in the streets and all that. I mean, we've already seen part of that from the last one. And it's been building silently until it's just going to blossom out. And, uh, you know, uh, that's what we're going to need the Lord because whoever else is going to be leading this country isn't going to be the solution to the problem. Instructing us to be knowledgeable and aware of the latter day events so that we're prepared. So, you know, I personally don't look at the news because it's depressing. 
<laughs> but at the same time, I need to still be aware. So you guys tell me about it. I'm not going to look at it. I'm looking at weather and sports. <laughs> so all the other stuff kind of keep me filled in that it's really bad. I only look at Christian Broadcasting Network. That's all. That's really the only thing I, I, I don't pay attention to anything else because if it's not biblically relevant, uh, yep. you watch the weather though. I, I do. I watch, yeah, I watch the weather. <laughs> I, I did know that the snow was coming. Yeah. And it was kind of disappointing. I, I, we got I, over a foot. I took the fuel out of my snow globe. You got a foot. We got, we got over a foot. Okay. Yeah, we got a lot of snow. All right. 15 inches. I feel yeah. better about that. Not, not for. Oh, yeah, no, it was chaos. It was crazy. Well, you see, I took the fuel out of my. my, my nothing on the road. Yeah, yeah nothing. No. no, even my house, my driveway usually gets all the snow yeah. and nobody else does, but there was none. So I took the fuel out of my snowblower and I was really upset because <laughs> they're talking about a foot of snow. I'm thinking, good night. So I went back into the garbage to get the gas out of the thing. I actually threw it in the garbage. I shouldn't have done that. No, I do that. No, I'm going to put it in my car. So I was standing by, ready for the snowblower again. Okay, we got a ton. Caitlin went outside with her ruler, and the ruler went into the snow and was buried in it. Wow. That was a lot of snow. It was a lot, yeah. Well, you guys live in a snow belt. So. What did you get for living down there? Well, makes all the difference. Continuing what doesn't mean. Uh, deeper insight into future events. Sorry about that. Um, it says here that what? Lack of unity. Lack of unity and obedience to the principles of God yield a weakened foundation, increased confusion, and withdrawal of protection from the Lord. That's historical, right? That's in our time we can see that. Evident uh, the, the portion of the capital uh, being foundation being uh, cracking and military involvement in the cities and chaos in the streets. Yep. Angel said that the country would uh, fall into confusion because of the lack of unity and people would suffer. Does that sound like today? There is no unity anywhere. It's, it's, social media has been a wonderful gift to us, but it's also been the most divisive thing that we could have ever had happen because in an instant, you can create opposition to all things in a moment. Mm -hmm. And depending upon the purpose, pers people's persuasion, if they're not founded on the principles of God and that foundation, you don't know where that's going to take you, those opinions. And we see that every day. Mm -hmm. Church of Jesus Christ is depicted as the world operations will become a haven of rest for those who are willing and open to hearing and accepting the principles of Jesus Christ. So this is where they're talking about that facility is kind of a type and shadow of the church itself and the gospel that we believe in wherever we're at. So don't have to pack your bags for Pennsylvania yet. Mm. You know, many were seen uh, running to the World Conference Center and many in, in the days of trouble. Uh, we are in a safe place with the church and our, our beliefs. Uh, we find a protection and depicted by the wall surrounding the World Operations Center. Representative of holding firmly to the belief of the Church of Jesus Christ or any branch and be depicted as a safe haven. So again, that's that idea of this whole thing. That, you know, we have to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we do as our foundation, our articles of faith and doctrine that give us that foundation and all the other things that we derive from this teaching and the preaching that we've heard. You know, if we can just hold fast to that, even here in Denver, you know, it says that there'll be a wall surrounding us of protection, just a few of us, you know, Oh, okay. what's it mean again? Deeper insights. Um, somebody want to read that in the entirety? Read your reception of greater information will come to us with the coming forth of the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon, the records of the brother of Jared, as described in the Book of Mormon, specifically Ether 3, 5, and 2 Nephi 27. This portion was not permitted to be transla translated by Joseph Smith. Huh. The brother of Jared saw all things from the beginning of time to the end and was commanded that he, that the information would come forth by the power of God in the Lord's time. This is the hope for the church in the latter days and greater truth will be given if this information is presented. The depiction of the record in the WOC shows this record will be given to the church of Jesus Christ all will be witness to the truth of it. This will give validity to the Book of Mormon and validate the priesthood authority given to the church. 
Yeah, what we talked about, right? Yes. There's more to come that's going to enlighten not only us, but also bring maybe some of these other people that right. considered the Book of Mormon and are please kind of wonky, you know, and it's going to kind of get all erased. Yeah. And that's kind of because of the Lord, not what anything we're going to do. We just got to hold fast to our thinking. We have to be anchored in our belief because when this time comes, people will be coming to us. to looking for that stability in life because there's madness all around. And uh, that may be our purpose for Denver. Now we think in all these years, we're going to be a, like a huge branch and all that stuff. Well, maybe it's just preparation for the future times that when this time comes, the few of us are going to be anchored enough that somebody, even within our families, perhaps sees the light, you know, our neighbors, the people you work with and all that will be changed because we sell fast to our belief and we didn't give in to the chaos that was there. The third question, by the way, the second experience is quicker than this, so we can go through that quicker. Anybody want to take a shot at that? This message applies to the Church of Jesus Christ individually and collectively. We as individuals need to be found faithful, serving Jesus Christ, covered by his blood and his righteousness. We need to keep our hearts pure through individual surrender to his commandments and will, maintaining a perpetual spiritual readiness no matter what chaos or hardships occur. We must possess the pure love of God and be cleansed of sin in order to reach a level of righteousness and sufficient faith, Ether 4 6, that in so doing, the church will be blessed with greater power to the truth of the Book of Mormon and the Restoration. Uh, Ether 4 6, I was going to suggest Ether 4 6 through the, the 19th verse are things that Jesus talks about mm -hmm. that will give us insight, a little more detail in terms of what this talks about here. So um, we'll show something to you here that will help you with your study on that. Any questions on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the that's why that portion of the book was so um, it was sealed. I think for a reason because perhaps the Lord wasn't prepared to see it at that time. But um, the Re Book of Revelation gives some detail, but it's very um, symbolic. There's a lot of symbols that okay, confusion. Are, are hard. Yeah, you wouldn't. And the Book of Mormon is a lot more plain. It's more clear. And if that gives us understanding from the beginning to the end, there yep. won't be any. Yep. Of course, when that comes forth, it's almost to the end. That's the end. So, yeah. Yeah. no. Yeah. We've got a head start on a lot of people that are going to have a revelation here when this comes out. Yeah. Okay. We're getting to the end of this one here. If the experience applies to the church, how can we implement the message of the experience? A quorum of 12 apostles working hand in hand with the general church priesthood must encourage and advise the saints to stay within the ark of safety, the church. Study the scriptures, in particular those that help us understand the events that will befall our nation and the world as the Lord unfolds his plan. For many, these scriptures are difficult to assimilate and can seem irrelevant. We need to help everyone acquire a heartfelt understanding of them as relevant context. Yeah. The message can be implemented by the ministry going through the scriptures and preaching and teaching in Sunday school classes and midweek services. All aspects of the experience conveys an urgency. Therefore, we are admonished to clear our vision, focus, and purge our hearts of malice, filling them instead with the love of God in order to see and participate in God's unfolding plan and kingdom with Jesus. So this is a team effort. It starts with the apostles. It was just giving us some interpretation of this dream to give to the ministry, to share with you. And it comes back to all of us in terms of the preaching, the teaching, the studying that you put forth in your testimonies about what's going on in life, anchored in you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the fact that, you know what, this isn't a, a dream. This isn't some um, unspoken reality. This is life. This is real. And we need to kind of collectively kind of represent that as we will. And as we occupy our time with that, then maybe the effects of all this nonsense that goes around us would not bring us down as much as it could have because we've got hope. And we talk about so many times, what do people do out there who don't have Christ as an anchor to give them hope that you can get through this trial. It's hopeless. It's more chaos. Okay, we're done with that one. Now, um, there is more. I'm going to email this to you. Um, 
if you did, some of you already have it, it's been in the minutes of the church and all that, but they did also a study guide of what we just went through. And it talks about segments of each part of the experience. It gives comments that the apostles chatted about in the middle here. And it gives you some scriptural references that support the comments that support the thing. We won't go through this is like nine pages. So we're not gonna go through that today. I'll email this to you. So at your leisure or whatever, if you have the inclination to kind of delve into the scriptures more about what also, they did a heck of a job, you know, in doing it. Maybe that's why it took them a year to do it. I don't know, but, but I'll, I'll send that to you as well. And we're gonna quickly go through, any comments on this one? It just, it gives us hope. You know, yeah, things right now are scary and probably going to get scarier, but we do have that hope and blessed assurance that if we're right, we'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be okay. Yeah. Because yeah. we're, we're okay on this side of the fence or on the Lord's side of the yeah, fence. Yeah, that's true. Whether we're here or we're in paradise of God, it really doesn't. And yeah. <laughs> and it, but to Carrie's point, it's the uncomfortableness that you have to go through while you're here. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know, there's while you're breathing, you got to. Yeah. There's out. there's some <laughs> adjustment we got to make, and there's some. Affliction, I guess, that goes with that to, to the word that Ross likes, right? Pray for the saints and their afflictions. And if, sick and yeah, sick and afflicted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is one that was uh, given on t October 10th of 21 from someone in the Fredonia Mission. That's up in north, uh, northwest Pennsylvania, by Erie, Pennsylvania. A small mission, uh, kind of like us. That's where Brother Joel works. And Sister Ruth, they kind of got mission there. Um, well, I well, I thought Erie and Fredonia were together. I don't know. I thought I have so. no idea what Fredonia is. I know. Is. Well, they're in that area. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So, um, Fredonia, I know, has a building. I don't know if Erie did, but interesting. we'll see. Well, that's not the point. So, I need yeah. some help with this one. Okay, we'll start, we'll start over. <laughs> <laughs> Last night, I had a dream. It started out that I was in a field of sorts. Sorts? Yeah, and the weather was terrible, and there were tornadoes that were supposed to be coming that way. I decided I needed to look for shelter, and there were people who were seeking shelter by just hunkering down in open areas. But I kept searching. I knew I was near the Fredonian mission. I just had to get to it. Finally, I got closer to the building, and I could see that not only were tornadoes and issues, but there was a raging fire that was sweeping up everything in its path from another direction, and it was headed towards the mission as well. I knew I had to get there before everything was consumed by either this fire or the tornado. Okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah, another, Woo. another exciting. terrible time, you know. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you just stop with that, I mean, forget it, you know. <laughs> but there's more. And it's more fair. Caitlin, you, can you read that? You want to read it? <laughs> no? Okay. Well, tell me when you want sometime, okay? Yeah. You can be part, part of that. I can read. I found my way into the building through our front entrance, and when I was entering the sanctuary, I saw both sides of the pews. On the right side was my mother, who appeared to be knelt down in prayer. On the other side was the rest of the Fredonia members standing together in prayer. I went over... <clears throat> To them to join in. I never once tried to go to my mother, even though I would have thought I would have because I just lost her almost a month ago. While we were in the building, in the building you could hear the howling winds outside and things being tossed against the building. You could touch the floor of the building and feel the heat <laughs> from the fire, but that was all. While in the huddle of prayer, I felt that the building and us should be consumed by the fire or tornado then this would be the best place to be when my life would end. Bless okay. Me. Where's the good news? And why so did he, he go to his mother? So he saw well, his mother, but his mother had passed away. Yeah, we'll get to that. That that's that's there's reference to that there. You're ahead of us. <laughs> his mother had passed away. So right. it was like she was separated from the group. Right. Yeah. That the live people were here and the not live people were over there. Is that it? Next one. Next, oh, one. next one. Okay. But there was this amazing feeling of calm 
and not only myself, but everyone else. Mm -hmm. Then everything going on outside the church building stopped. The weather was calm and the fire was gone. Our building was preserved. The only thing was that some of the floorboards seemed loose. God took care of us and the building. Any similarity with this and the other one? Get any connection yet? Safety. Remember the wall that surrounded the World Operations Center? Mm -hmm. You know, that storm, that tornado, that fire couldn't penetrate that. You can't penetrate it here in the Fredonia mission. The protection was there. Similar connection yeah. to that whole thing that, you know, as we're in the gospel, wherever we are at, not in Fredonia or not in Greensburg or wherever we're at, that protection surrounds us from any fire, tornado, or chaos that we could be susceptible to in that situation. God took care of us in the building. Now, the floorboard seeming loose is interesting. Before you get to that one yeah. question, now that the, the fire and tornado can be symbolic of, you know, but wasn't the church given an experience like a year or two ago that, um, that said, you will see natural disasters by my hand. Mm -hmm. And we are. I mean, Colorado's Fires. on fire all the time. California. You know, California and, and, you know, tornadoes where they're not supposed to be tornadoes, hurricanes, you know, snow in Hawaii. I mean, all this weird stuff that people will say, well, that's climate change. And maybe it is, but who's, yeah, who's, who's, who's climate? in charge of the climate? Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. who's yeah. in charge of the climate? But I'm saying, so that that might be symbolic, but it also might be actual. Yeah, absolutely. We are seeing that. Yeah, we are. Again, this is all real time. Yeah. This is all real time. You no, know, part of the problem too is as we as a successful nation, and the, uh, the 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 prosperity that we've had, we've taken the liberty to to move into areas that we weren't destined to live in. Some places in the mountains, right around here. And when we moved out here, what, 19 years ago or so, there was nothing other than this community here. None of this was here. Southland was not even there yet and all that. And we had a tornado that came over into the next thing and kind of ripped right by. I mean, we saw the thing from the porch. You did? Yeah. When? Well, this is years ago. This is oh, before okay. that Sorrell Ranch was built. Oh, okay. But now what do you see? There's houses from Sorrell Ranch down to, down to Parker, you know? And, and as these natural disasters, I mean, this is a climate area for tornadoes to happen. This is where they breed because of the effects of the mountain and the wind and the climate. Yep. You know, what do you think is going to happen now that we have all these communities here? These people have gone to the mountains to enjoy the beauty of the mountains and live amongst the trees and the woods. And what happens? It's a natural progression of fire. That's what's happened for thousands of years. That's how the earth cleanses itself in those situations. But now people live in those situations. Californians who want to live on the cliff by the beach as the erosion has always hit the shore as the ground becomes unstable and these houses fall into the ocean. You know, what do you think? So, so we as a people are dumb. You know, I mean, we, 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 we shouldn't be going where we go, but we're going to blame climate change or we're going to blame other things and other things. But to your point, it's God and his plan saying, okay, if you want to do that, then you know what, you know, you gotta, you gotta expect maybe some of these things to happen because this is what I've done when I created the world. Tornadoes and earthquakes and hurricanes and mudslides are all part of his development of creativity, I think. And if we choose to live in the areas of one of those things, well then, I don't know what kind of wisdom we have. That's just an editorial yeah. comment. Yeah, we, and I were reading um, in her reading book this week about um, a Johnstown flood in Pennsylvania yeah, disaster. and the, you know, the biggest flood of the century or whatever in that part of the country. And so we were talking about um, other di natural disasters. And one of the things we talked about was Katrina. I mean, they literally built- Where do they live? They live below sea level. Yeah, below, below, ones, sea, yeah. Level. <laughs> below sea level on the edge of the- the Johnstown flood, it was created by a bunch of rich people that right. lived up there and had a country club and didn't right. maintain the dam. Right. And as the water came and ate away the dam, that whole thing came down and wiped out those people. I was in right. Johnstown. They have a museum there. Right. I mean, it's it's, it's terrific. But people were neglectful. Right. People lived in the way of these things. Right. And this is what happened. So shame on us sometimes. We live a reservoir right back here. Aurora Reservoir. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Better check the insurance to see if we have flood insurance. <laughs> okay, the responses. Is it a revelation of God? Is he making known something new or 
for reaffirming. It's a, it's a revelation of God. The, the apostles came to a conclusion. It's an experience and a reaffirmation, a reminder that there is safety in the church of Jesus Christ. There's safety in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's safety in how we prepare from the last experience. How do we prepare to, to get through this stuff that's going to happen, that is happening? What does it mean? As we are aware of the prophecies of destruction, the experience tells us that there will be fulfilled in a land that is turned away from God and his principles that have become susceptible to the effects of purging or destruction. Mosiah, when they, so, so, that's it, that's it. I mean, it was there predicted in Mosiah, yeah. in Benjamin's days, yeah. you know, and we see it today and it's, it's, it's reliving the predictions that are there. Um, people turning away from God creates this problem. The church of Jesus Christ, with the exception of Jesus Christ, is the necessary safe place. The believers must be found because protection is not available outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Continuing with the meaning, when the dreamer and others were seen inside already praying, indicates that other believers found safety in the church though still seeking for his protection. The dreamer's mother well, I was also seen praying in the church, but separated from the group, symbolizing her having passed away as a as a faithful sister. So that's that's why he didn't go to her. He couldn't. There's a veil. Yeah, she's gone. Separating. But but the reality was that he knew that she was praying for them from the other side. Again, another maybe tidbit of hope that you know when we kind of move from this to that, we're I, still involved. I think they're busy. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Very busy. Does it apply to the church or an individual? It applies to both the church and the world. It says the members of the church must understand our role in taking the spiritual shelter, to take spiritual shelter and to offer sanctuary to the world for others through the gospel that we have. Okay, one more, I think. If it explains to the church, how can we implement the message? We need to continue to teach and encourage. That's from the last experience as well. It talked about that. Stay close to the Lord. That was from the last experience as well. Trust him through the trials, uh, trails, trials and teach them of the latter-day promises so they understand and they're not fearful. That's one of our roles again. We need to be the, 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 the symbols of faith, if you will. As the wind is blowing and the fire is kind of coming near us, we got to be stable in our belief, okay? Learn more of the latter-day events and prophecies. That's from the last experience as well. So we are equipped to understand the plan of God and remind ourselves as often as necessary that we are not only the seekers of shelter, but we collectively compromise the body of Christ and we need to be a provider of shelter for those that are weak in spirit. I think that's it. We made it. <laughs> there, there was an explanation about the floorboards being loose. Yeah. And then my brother had a, a, an experience that confirmed whatever the meaning was. I can't remember what well, it was. I think the meaning was that members within the church weren't as anchored okay. as we need to be. Yeah. We were loose boards, so to speak, you know? Yeah. And I, and I think it gives a reminder sense. to those of us. And I mean, that goes to the last experience because mm -hmm. six times it said anchored, anchored, mm -hmm. anchored. And if our floorboards are a little loose and not anchored, it's saying, you know, it's time for you to put some nails in there yeah. and cinch them down. It, it, I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, but, that makes sense. You know, and, you know if you're shaky, yeah, you have a loose floorboards, you're more susceptible to the fear of all exactly. this. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's that's the word fear. You know mm -hmm. that the enemy wants us to be afraid, and right. you know, my uncle always says, "Be concerned, but not consumed." Mm -hmm. You know, and take it even further and just say. If we're if we're right and we do things we're supposed to, then you know we shouldn't be afraid. Yeah. yeah. Eyes wide open. Yeah. I mean, you don't you want to be aware of like what's going on, but yeah. not a, not afraid of not it. Not afraid. Because I mean, well, I think that's the it's essence. It's not the first time the world's been crazy. I think that's the <laughs> essence of both these experiences: be aware and be prepared. I yeah. think if we can sum all that up in a couple things, that's it. Life is happening. It's being validated from the history of the gospel and, and what's going to occur. We just need to kind of understand it better. We need to be firm in our faith and not uh, not uh, worried about it, let's say. Because 
We've got that wall of protection through what we believe in the gospel. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks for having up in there. We lost Chuck. <laughs> where's Joyce? And where's Joyce? Maybe we talked too long. She may have lost signal. I mean, oh, oh. that with Chuck. Why don't you sing a song and then Brother Jeremy's going to open for you. Okay. We're about to set the table boat. Oh. You want to take care of that? Oh, no. Let's sing a song for setting the table. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What? What happened to everybody? <sighs> yeah, pick one we know. I don't know. It's Jeremy's going to play too and speak. <laughs> Passengers and pills. Okay. Was, I was right. How about 76? Higher spiritual mind. That's, That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh oh. <laughs> Keep the technology going here. Um, well, I'm really glad I was here today to hear the Sunday school and you know the uh, the message of these experiences because you know we read these things and we hear about them, but when we see God's revelation, it's such a confirmation of you know us understanding correctly. And uh, my uh, my message today kind of goes along with that very much and also with the song we just sang uh, because what we have uh, going around in the world is chaos 
And in the midst of that, our goal is to move from chaos to order. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, God has a plan. And uh, it's uh, important for us to understand it and to be anchored in that plan. And uh, so that's really my topic today, that we might be able to, uh, to organize our thinking. And ultimately in turn, organize our life. Um, and so really what I wanted to talk about is, is sort of a study on the 28th chapter of 2 Nephi. And that is a tremendous uh, chapter, uh, that's for sure. We actually did a class, uh, and this is maybe a plug for our YouTube channel, but we did a class on Friday uh, about the character of God um, and how we can have godly character. And that really positions us, I think, to handle what's going on in the world because, uh, well, as these things go on, it sort of falls to us to determine how to respond to it. And godly character will point the way in, in doing that. And so, you know, one of the things we talked about is that uh, in the world, you see something happening, perhaps, that re, uh, politics is displacing religion for many people. And that becomes sort of the, the focus and, and also the solution, you know, that people look to to solve the issues. And I don't think it takes a lot of observation to tell that that's really getting us nowhere. <laughs> uh, it's a cycle of uh, futility, you might say. <laughs> Uh, but uh, what we're going to be uh, thinking about, talking about here today is sort of, uh, well, it's sorting out what you actually think and believe. And, uh, you know, I think that as you hear these things and these experiences, you kind of have to process it and, and understand it. And also sort of think about your life and how it plugs into that. And, and thinking about all that is hard work. And in fact, to think and really meditate upon the things of God is as much exertion as just about anything else in life. And, and this is kind of what I'm encouraging you to do today is to really think about the Lord, to put forth the effort to uh, understand and to Put yourself into the plan of God, the picture of, uh, that, that the Lord is giving us to make sure we fit in somewhere. To make sure that we're, uh, we're solid and anchored in a time of storms and, uh, and disruption and, uh, and judgment, ultimately. And so, uh, you know, when we think about the things of God, we're really putting our life in order and we're taking responsibility for ourselves. And that feels good. It, it's, it's work, but it feels good to take accountability, to say, you know, I'm not going to run away hiding from this because I understand that that's not going to do me any good. The one person uh, in that last dream who basically, you know, was saying there were many who just kind of hunkered down where they were but the fire was coming. What, what good is that? And so, uh, you know, it's, it's helpful for us to take responsibility for ourselves and for those around us. And, you know, we find ourselves, I think, in this maddening position, kind of like Noah, because here he is building the solution and people wouldn't pay attention and take advantage of it. And, and what a tragedy that is. And so um, one of the things I'll put out here is that you need to think for yourself rather than let others think for you. And boy, you know, it's, it's tempting to do that because thinking is a lot of work. You know, if there's a system in place, I just assume use that versus reinvent the wheel and come up with a whole new system, right? Um, you know, maybe I'm not a fan of Ford or all the car companies because they're too expensive. 
I got to buy a new car. I don't really want to shell out 30, 40 grand or more. But I'm also not willing to invent the systems to create my own car, right? <laughs> that would be more work, right? So I just have to swallow the pill, I guess, and make the car payment. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you do have to check out and realize that the people making the systems have gotten so corrupt that we would want nothing to do with it. And that's what's happening today, that we don't get sucked into the thinking that uh, it's going to be this next political leader, like Walt was saying, or, or um, some sort of uh, party, or uh, I don't know uh, what other legitimate refuge the world is offering us today, but it's, it's, not, making, it's make, not making the cut for me. And so, um, you know, we, we really have to understand for ourselves. And what's so amazing about God is that he offers us that, a direct relationship to him, that he would speak to these individuals who have these experiences directly, and that he does the same for us. And if we're faithful and open in our hearts, you can feel his spirit today. You can feel a stirring within you. That subtle reassurance from the hand of God that this, what we're talking about, is true. And that's uh, also comforting, I think. And I, I guess what, what also, not only is it hard work to think, and it's just easier to let someone else do the work for us, uh, here's the other risk uh, with thinking, is that you might land in a conclusion that makes you at odds with the world. Because guess what? If you come up with a new car that costs half as much, Ford isn't going to be so happy. If you come up with an answer that is superior to that which is the, uh, offered by the world, well, they're going to make you an enemy. And yet that is exactly what the scriptures say. Wow, what a coincidence that God preordained this idea millennia ago that when we align ourselves with him we make ourselves enemies to the world and unfortunately there's just no way around it especially in this day and time when we're heading to a confrontation of good and evil and every person without exception is going to have to make a choice of which side they're going to land on that if you don't understand what's going on in the world today that's basically it in a nutshell and we have to pick sides. I, I wish there was an easier way. Uh, but you know what? The hardness of that is going to sharpen our character and make us formidable uh, people. And it's going to force us to have character, to have uh, courage and faith in the unseen, and yet more and more seen in our time, the hand of God. Because, boy, it is... Um, it is becoming manifested, I think, uh, to such a great extent now. And so a few things uh, to offer you as, as methods here to carry out the task of thinking and processing through what's, what's going on. Um, one is that you might ask yourself, how do you know what you think? Because I think many times people say, I identify as someone who believes in God. But does that actually mean a whole lot when you consider their life? Uh, you know, I, I think really as we sort of hit this time period of having to really um, pick a side and not ride the fence, it is sort of becoming uncomfortable, <laughs> to say the least, for people who might be lukewarm. And, you know, I, I heard this the other day that, you know, this is an interesting thought that the, the West in general is really kind of um, very void of spirituality. You know, we have these ideals and we have identities and we have belonging to churches, but, but the lifestyle of people isn't necessarily what it should be. And so another way to put it is that, you know, I, I would claim a belief I would say the words that I believe, but I don't really put that into practice. And how that might look in our lives, if we're not careful, uh, thinking of those loose floorboards, is that I might 
I might believe. I, th I might think I believe. I might actually get baptized. I might go to church. I might say a prayer here and there uh, when I eat and, and when I go to bed at night. But most of my time is spent somewhere else. My priorities are really elsewhere. 95% of my uh, desire and interests and focus is on things that are not rooted in spiritual truth. This is possible, I think, to have that sort of disconnect uh, or contradiction in our lives. And so what we really think is what we live. What we really believe is what we practice. And so we need to put what we think we believe into practice. So that's kind of an answer to two questions. What do I really believe? And if it's not so good, what I actually believe, how do I change it? And that's probably the answer, that we would put things into practice. So it's not just spending 5% of your week uh, doing the, going through the motions that you might identify as a Christian, but rather it, it would be connecting with God on a regular basis. It would be uh, much more time in prayer. That's what I think. I think that we might say that we should be spending, if it's five minutes now, maybe we up that to 15 minutes or 20 minutes a day in prayer with the Lord, that we would actually connect with him and, and really sort out our life with prayer uh, alongside the efforts and presence of God. And so that's one way, right, that we can put into practice. And, uh, you know, we, we want to be those people, those places of refuge for our neighbors, uh, because we do see what's brewing and that this time would come when they're not sure where to turn and we have to be um, anchored and pillars and beacons of light uh, to them to, uh, to help them and, and encourage them and to lift up their faith and, and help them overcome their fear. And so, you know, another question, you know, of course, is, is really, uh, how do you tell what is true? And, and that's part of what we're saying today is think about it. Think really carefully about it. And, uh, you know, if, like history teaches us, that once again, the civilization of this country, you know, what do civilizations do? They rise and they fall. If ours were to fall, what would be the, uh, you know, the structure that I hold on to in my life? You know, if, if everything that I've been kind of working towards all my life is contingent upon things going well in the United States, and that doesn't happen, what's my backup plan? And, and God is the backup plan today. Um, So, you know, th these are some things to, to consider and, uh, you know, four or five ideas about how we think, what we think, changing it, making sure that it's, it's correct and putting it into practice. And so that kind of brings us now to this, this, uh, this chapter in, in 2 Nephi 28. And uh, I want you to just think about these words and consider, you know, does this line up to what I was saying? Do you think that this... Uh, could be sort of uh, interpreted that way. And so he says in the first verse, and now behold, my brethren, I have spoken unto you according as the spirit hath constrained me. Wherefore, I know that they must surely come to pass. And the things which shall be written out of the book shall be of great worth unto the children of men and especially unto your seed. So, you know, we were just, reading about that in the experience, that, uh, you know, this record would come forth, and we have part of it, and more of it is coming, and it, what a wisdom, what a great purpose that is of God, that he would put forth some of it, and test the waters, and give us a century or two, uh, to mull that over, and see if we don't accept it, and to see uh, that we're getting enough, uh, you know, collectively speaking, and the acceptance of the Book of Mormon in this country, where it was discovered. And then, you know, all this time later to say, okay, you didn't believe the first half. Well, the second half is twice as powerful. Let me whack you with that and see if that wakes you up, you know, and that's exactly what's going to happen. I mean, crudely speaking, right? 
I don't know if the Lord would say whack, but it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it'll be a, a sort of like that, a smack, you know, mentally speaking, to awaken us to a truth. And um, so this is kind of setting the tone here. He says, for it shall, now this, this is where it gets real. <laughs> for it, uh, it shall come to pass in that day that the churches which are built up and not unto the Lord. Okay, this is immediately starting to resonate for us, isn't it? When the one shall say unto the other, Behold, I, I am the Lord's, and the other shall say, I, I am the Lord's. And thus shall everyone say that hath built up churches and not unto the Lord. So basically what this is saying is that there's all these churches that are in disagreement with each other, claiming to be of the Lord's, and none of them are. That's quite a statement. And I think that's what we're witnessing. And it's going to go on here to say why that is. It says, they shall contend one with another, and their priests shall contend one with another, and they shall teach with their learnings and deny the Holy Ghost, which giveth utterance. So uh, lack of unity uh, in reliance upon teaching of schools instead of the spirit of God, right? Um, the thinking of man, you know, and it says literally here in the fifth verse, and they deny the power of God, the Holy One of Israel. And they say unto the people, hearken unto us and hear ye our precept for behold, there is no God today for the Lord and Redeemer hath done his work, and he hath given his power unto men. Behold, hearken ye unto my precept, if they shall say a miracle is wrought by the hand of God, believe it not, for this day he is not a God of miracles, he hath done his work. Now, I don't know if you hear people literally saying that, um, but they are acting it out. Once again, there's this disconnect between what we say and what we actually believe. Although I will say that there are a number of people I've talked to of Christian belief who have overtly said these things. They say that, you know, there was a time in which God did mighty miracles, like in the book of Exodus, but that time is past. He has a purpose now that's different. And so they're not quite saying there's no God, but they are saying he doesn't have any power. It, it's, it's this half half you know truth i believe in god but half very much uh not really <laughs> right don't believe in his power um and so he says yea there shall be many which say um eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die and it shall be well with us and so he kind of goes on and talks about how um you know that the lord will justify in committing a little sin and we can do some things like this and uh, it'll it'll be okay, you know. Maybe God will beat us for, with a few stripes, and then at the end we'll be saved. And it says, "Yea, and there shall be many which shall teach after this manner, false and vain and foolish doctrines, and sh they shall be puffed up in their hearts, and shall seek deep to hide their counsels from the Lord, and their works shall be in the dark, and the blood of the saints shall cry from the ground against them." Uh, and, and it says they are corrupted and, and they're prideful uh, because of false teachers and false doctrines. Their churches have become corrupted and their, their churches are lifted up because of pride. And they, they rob the poor because of their sanctuaries and their fine clothing, uh, their fine buildings. Now, I, I, I see all this today, right? I mean, I see people more focused on image and, you know, great uh, facilities a lot of money, a lot of programs, but there's no truth in it. There's no sincerity in it. There's no actual love in it. And so all these things sort of mislead people. And it's such a shame because if you're looking for an out to say, you know, I don't really need to hold myself accountable to the things that uh, would be uh, within uh, church or within religion, because I see all these people who are doing it wrong and they're not so great. And that's, that's a compelling argument. But in the end, it's not going to be the winning argument because although the enemy has been very crafty in trying to undermine in every way possible a true faith and a true God, God is still God. 
And all these things we see are happening today, they have been prophesied. And I, I have to imagine that stirs our faith and increases our belief today because we're seeing the news looking like the scripture. And, and, and that's what we're doing right now. We're reading about these churches and then we're looking around and we can see this does match. It, it's what I see happening. And he says uh, that, uh, you know, this is not good, <laughs> right? And he says in the 15th verse, uh, after he gets done talking about all these sins, he says, oh, the wise and the learned and the rich, they are puffed up in the pride of their hearts. And all those who preach false doctrines and all those who commit whoredoms and pervert the right way of the Lord. Right? They take what looks good and they twist it around, right, to be something else. He says, woe, woe, woe be unto them. And the Lord God Almighty, for they shall be thrust down to hell. Now that's not a good end. No. That, um, you know... That's something that we have to contend with, the, the possibility, right, that there is a truth and that we don't want to be numbered among those who are against it, who are turning uh, away from the Lord. And so he says, you know, that these things will happen, that the wicked will be destroyed, and, uh, you know, that there is a lot of false teaching going on. And, you know, that we have to be careful and wary. Now, all of this kind of leads me to think that we should be thoughtful, that we should be careful in how we think, believe, and live. And so that's another way to uh, deepen our sincerity, isn't it? That we would um, spend time uh, meditating upon the things of God. Now, again, there's a look-alike in the world for doing that because the world is talking about meditating too aren't they as a very powerful and spiritual thing to do uh but i think in our instance when we meditate upon the things of god we're inviting the lord in to be part of that process and so i'd say that most of our meditation is really prayer uh we're not doing it alone by our own uh ability and limiting it to what I'm capable of, we're inviting the Lord in as part of that. And so I'm also not just thinking about it, I'm also praying about it and asking God for understanding. And uh, you know, these are the things that, that, we, that we need to be doing. And one, one thing I'll point out too in this uh, chapter, because I really do think the whole chapter is one worth studying, and it's very helpful for us in today's day and time. And so I would challenge everyone to read this, to think about it in the context of today and, and think about what it's telling us and, and respond accordingly. You know, it's a call to action. And it says here um, in the 26th verse, Yea, woe unto him that hearkeneth unto the precepts of men, and denieth the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost, okay? So that's basically saying, don't listen so much to people. Because guess what? They're all in disagreement. So that would be your first sign that they're not right, right? They can't all be right. And because most of them don't agree, the safer thing would be to just toss the whole thing and depend upon the Lord. That's kind of what this is saying, right, in the, in the scriptures. And then he says this, Yea, woe be unto him who saith, we have received and we need no more. Now that's exactly the situation in the bringing forth of the Book of Mormon, right? Because people said, I have the Bible and I don't need any more of the word of God. And you know what? Then why wouldn't you just take one step further and say, I have the word of God. I don't need the revelation of God. Because in my mind, God only spoke yesterday, and he stopped speaking, and there's no more to be had. And God is saying, that's not me. Whoever is teaching you that, it's the teaching of men. And, and you have to be open to the ongoing revelation and work that the Lord continues to do. And what an exciting time to think that while I'm a little unnerved by 
all of this and by the events of today and the revelations, that I'm also knowing that at the same time that's happening, this record of the Jaredites is going to come forth. And that it will, as it says in the word of God, contain all the mysteries to the end of time. It really will be the key, the encoder to the book of Revelation. It will give us all the understanding that we lack today about the remainder of time. Uh, that's pretty thrilling. And uh, it's anchoring, as we, as we talked about this morning, in a time when we need to be anchored. And so... And he says, and in fine, woe unto all those who tremble and are angry because of the truth of God. For behold, he is built upon the rock. He that is built upon the rock receiveth it with gladness. And he uh, that is built upon the sandy foundation trembleth lest he fall. And, and, and that's us today. We don't need to be trembling or afraid or built upon sand, uh, but, but solid in a day and time that doesn't feel so solid. And so there's a lot more that we could talk about in that chapter. Uh, but again, it's, it's good homework. I'll just say that. It's good to take it home and really uh, consider it. Um, and so to kind of start to wrap up here, I just wanted to give you some takeaways because uh, when you think more uh, and you organize your thoughts, one of the outcomes of that is that you get your life, your priorities in order. You know, what matters the most? And there's a song we sing uh, that's called Second to God. And it's kind of a, a love song in some ways between a husband and wife. But underneath that, it, there's another message, too, about priorities. He says, say, oh, how are you living? What rules your life? As for blessings, you hunger and thirst. Remember the lessons once taught to me. God must always, must always come first. Those are our priorities. Uh, you know, that's boiled down into one idea, right? But you have to expand that into all the other areas of your life. That's what I'm encouraging today, that we do the work, that we process through that, that we say, okay, what does that mean? And how do I live it out in my life? And so our priority is God, and everything else needs to tie into that. And because God is so big and uh, encompasses the world and all that we are and all that we have in this place, uh, that's not a limiting statement like it might sound, uh, to tie everything in your life to God. It's actually the perfect order in which we can operate as the creation of God. And so to me, this is very exciting. And so again, how are we going to live out what we think? Are we sure we know what we think? And are we sure that what we think is right? Um, our time, our energy, our resources, what we put our hope in, hopefully those things are tied to the Lord. Because, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's so important that we get this right. And that we do the things that the Lord wants us to do. And so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of give you that car analogy again. You know, we, we have, uh, uh, we, we don't know what goes into making a car. Uh, but I know that if I go to the Ford plant, I'm not going to see, um, you know, the same person working on glass and then spending the other half of their day working on the electrical systems or the frame of the vehicle, right? In order for that car to come out of the end of the assembly line, there has to be some order. And so you have um, an area that does the electrical, right? And that's what they specialize in, in a different area that builds the uh, frame and, and a different area that gets the glass. And that has to be, you know, the right kind and shape and everything. And then there are people putting it all together. And at the end, you have something. You have something that, that is, is functioning, right? And that's what we want. We want to be functioning uh, the way that we were designed to function. And so, um, you know, these are, uh, I think, very deep things to consider. 
and they are what will anchor us. And so as that experience says, both of them, right, with such emphasis to be anchored, to understand where you stand and how and why. This is what's going to carry us through the days ahead. I know it's maybe overwhelming to consider, but the Lord's going to help us with it. And the more we exercise faith in him, the more that will become a reality. Uh, so I, may God bless you today. I am thankful for the truth that he's given us. That he's given us a sneak peek and uh, uh, so much to hold on to uh, because the end of the story is going to be so beautiful. And everything that I was thinking this, this morning, you know, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And that's what we're going to see today, I think, is that all he's given, that maybe we've taken for granted all these years, he's going to start taking away. But for the purpose, like in the story of Job, that he might give even more in the end. Mm -hmm. And so we're holding on to, um, well, we're holding on to our, our seats. <laughs> but for good purpose, there is wisdom and purpose in this storm that we're in, and it will have a good outcome. Uh, we have to hold on, though and see the end of it. So may, may God bless you as we do that together. Good message. You spark some testimony in less than 10 seconds. <laughs> oh, we're on. Joe, okay. <laughs>